So welcome everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us for today's um, national webinar series event, The Fundamentals of Financial Capability, Human-Centered Design, and Racial Equity. So as we like to do with all of our presentations, we like to just give ourselves pause and start by grounding ourselves in the promise of community action. We do this purposefully. We think it's really important um, because regardless of our different positions, our geographic location, you know, the different focus areas of our work, this is the one thing that centers us all together um, in our work in community action. And it states that community action changes people's lives, embodies the spirit of hope, improves communities, and makes America a better place to live. We care about the entire community, and we are dedicated to helping people help themselves and each other. So a little bit about our project um, that is facilitating and bringing you all many of the webinar presentations that you see um, featured here on Wednesdays. Um, this is a part of our learning community project. And what we do through this work is we look to analyze different outcomes and identify effective, promising, and innovative practice models, both in the Community Action Network and outside um, in the human service field in general, to really think about ways that we can approach and alleviate the causes and conditions of poverty. Or to put it simply, we think about um, you know, working with you all, doing the research, uh, working with partners out in the field to help you all build your capacity to fight poverty more effectively. So some of the goals through doing this work, we really hope um, to help the network really be inspired on a wave of practice transformation, to change the way that you're doing your work, uh, not just within your organizations, but also outside in your communities as well. Thinking about how changing the way that you're providing services and doing it in a more informed, intentional way um, can really lead to some transformation. We hope that will lead to then changed lives, again, both within your organization, thinking about your staff, um, and also with um, your clients and customers that you're serving in your communities. And we hope that will come together to actually create thriving, healthy uh, communities across the United States. So here you can see some of the various focus areas that we are looking at this year in the learning community. Um, you can find plenty of information on all of these different uh, focus areas, like I said, on our resource library on our website. Um, and we do all of these things because it helps us kind of achieve that middle part right there here you see in our network theory of change, thinking about all the things that we do as a network to come together to really live up to that promise. Um, what we seek to do through this project is provide you with just some innovative strategies to really do that middle part so that we can uphold and achieve the three goals that you see at the top. So here you can see the members of our team uh, that come together to lead this work. We are led in our efforts by Tiffany Marley. She is our Director of Practice Transformation. Um, we're also joined by Lil Dupree. She is our Senior Associate for Research. Courtney Kohler, who is another Senior Associate on the project. We are also excited this year to have Kevin Kelly join us. He is our Director of Community Economic Development. We're also joined uh, by the wonderful Jeannie Chaffin. She is our consultant working with us primarily on our whole family approach efforts. Um, and of course, Amy Robert, she is a program associate on this work. So with that, um, I'm going to turn things over into the more than capable hands of our wonderful presenters today. You're going to hear from two of our great colleagues um, from Prosperity Now, uh, Jennifer Medina and Chanel Thompson, and they're going to walk us through the content for today's presentation. So Jennifer, I'm going to pass you the ball, um, and whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and get started. Uh, great to have you all on today's call. And as Hyacinth said, we're going to do um, fundamentals of financial capability, human centered design, and race equity. So we have an ambitious agenda ahead, but we're excited to engage you. Um, so, again, my name is Jennifer Medina. I'm an associate director at Prosperity Now on our savings and financial capability team. In that role, I've had the opportunity to provide one-on-one uh, -on -one technical assistance to uh, community action agencies, as well as um, other nonprofit community-based organizations, supporting with uh, the design and development of new products and services that are tailored to meet the financial needs and goals of, um, of program participants. And I am joined today by Chanel Thompson, and I'll let Chanel introduce herself. Thank you all Thank for joining you. us. My name is, sorry, are you all getting feedback? 
I hear you fine, okay. sir. Okay, great. Um, again, my name is Chanel Thompson. I'm the founder and CEO of Brick by Brick Consulting here in North Carolina. I also serve on the Community Steering Committee for Prosperity Now, and I've had the pleasure of working with the Racial Wealth and um, Equ- Racial Wealth Equity Network, um, as well as helping them through this process. So I'm excited to be a part of this, and look forward to having some great conversations with you all today. Thank you, Chanel. And for those of you. Pardon me. For those of you who are not familiar with Prosperity Now, we're a national nonprofit intermediary, or we're based in Washington, D.C., and our mission is to ensure that everyone in our country has a clear path to financial stability, wealth, and prosperity. And we do this work with countless partners in the field and across the USA, um, including many community action agencies like yours. So today, we're going to start with some get-to-know-you polls. Uh, We'll do an overview of financial capability, and I'll do an introduction to human-centered design, and then Chanel will walk us through an introduction to racial economic inequality. And it's our hope that through this webinar, you will have an opportunity to review the core components of financial capability and share with us and others on the call how your organization supports families with building financial capability. We want you to walk away familiar with human-centered design processes and have a chance to reflect on how those processes compare to how your organization approaches serving clients. And then we want you to learn about racial economic inequality in the United States and have a chance to reflect on how both current and historical policies and practices create disparities in economic outcomes that we see today. So to start, we have a poll. Uh, The question is, what programs does your community action agency provide? Um, I'm sure you you may provide some of these and many more, but want to just get a sense of uh, the different programmatic offerings. So uh, thank you, Hyacinth. I see that she's launched the, um, the poll. So we'll just give you a minute to respond. And in that pause, I guess I'll let us know how this is going to work. So folks will have about 45 seconds to go ahead and submit your responses to the poll. Um, Once most of you do so, I'm going to close it, and then it's going to take a few minutes to display here on the screen. And then, Jennifer, you can jump back in and connect that back into our content. So folks have about uh, 20 more seconds to get in their responses. Oh, and please make sure you respond to the poll and don't just send it in through the chat window so that we can capture it and we can all see it. All right, so thank you all for your responses. I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll um, and it's gonna take just a few seconds for the responses to display. So many of you, it's just taking a little while to filter through, but it's coming, and here we go. Great. Thank you so much. All right. So, um, looks like I'm not, I'm seeing the bar graph, but 33 out of 78, I'm not sure uh, percentage-wise, but um, many of you, uh, or pardon me, 36 of 78 doing providing LIHEAP. Uh, I think the next highest, many of you providing housing programs. Um, and then, um, unsurprisingly, many of you are doing uh, Head Start as well. So great. Glad to see that we have a number of, or, um, pardon me, a number of programs represented here. And then the second poll question is more about you and your role as the organization. So um, please go ahead and respond to the poll. Uh, which best describes your role at your organization? Are you a direct service provider, a program manager, part of the development staff, part of leadership, or maybe you serve in a different role? We'll give folks about 10 more seconds to get in your responses. Uh, 
All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll, and let's see if we can get the results. Okay, so it looks like most of you have responded. Um, we have 19 program managers, 11 direct service providers, wonderful, 10 representatives of the leadership team, and a couple of development staff. So welcome to all of you, and thank you for giving us a sense of who's on the call today. Um, so as I said, we're going to start off with an overview of financial capability, which I imagine is a familiar term for some of you. But to make sure we're all on the same page, I wanted to start by defining financial capability. So financial capability means you the capacity to manage financial resources effectively. And financial capability really varies person by person, um, often regardless of one's income or wealth. So let's drill down a little deeper into the different components of financial capability. So first, to effectively manage financial resources, we need knowledge. So for example, if I want to improve my credit score, I need to know what the factors are that make up my credit score. Um, and a common misconception, I think, about financial knowledge is that low-income or low-wealth individuals have less financial knowledge than high-income or high-wealth folks, when in fact, I, I think it's important that we acknowledge, and I'm sure you all see this demonstrated in the work with your program participants, that lower income and low wealth individuals are actually quite knowledgeable and quite savvy when it comes to making financial decisions because they are constantly having to do those cost benefit calculations in their mind to, to weigh the cost and benefits of different financial choices. Whereas higher income, higher wealth folks often can depend on a financial advisor um, or a financial planner. Um, I think another difference is that, you know, oftentimes if you're higher income, uh, you don't have to be kind of constantly making that most cost effective decision. There, you have some wiggle room in your budget where it's okay if that's not uh, the most financially sound uh, decision, whereas low income folks don't always have that, um, that, that leeway. The second element of financial capability is skills. So to manage financial resources effectively, we need to have the appropriate skills. So returning to that credit example, I might know that one factor that impacts my credit score is making on-time debt payments. But if I don't have the skill to set up the automatic payments or to call and negotiate a different due date with my lender, I might be less successful in making those payments on time. And then lastly, but perhaps most importantly, is access. We need to have access to quality, safe and affordable financial products and services that allow us to manage our resources effectively. So again, returning to that credit example, if I don't have access to affordable credit, I enter into a vicious cycle of relying on high cost, often predatory loans that will trap me in that cycle of debt. So financial capability requires knowledge, skills, and access. And I do want to point out that you know, over time in our country, Individuals have become increasingly responsible for their own long-term financial capability and security. So in the past, employers would provide defined retirement plans, or pardon me, defined, reti defined benefit retirement plans, which ensured that you had a lifelong stream of income for retired workers. But today, um, workers are largely responsible for ensuring that they have adequate retirement savings and that's mostly achieved through either personal savings or um, defined contribution plans. And we've seen increasingly that it's more and more difficult for Americans to be able to save enough to manage the long-term financial futures. So in our work at Prosperity Now with organizations across the country, we've seen them connect clients uh, to a number of different financial services and products. And this slide just summarizes some of those services uh, we've seen organizations provide financial education to increase knowledge, financial coaching, one-on-one -on -one counseling or advice. Uh, we've seen groups, particularly like workforce development programs, connecting their program participants to a safe and affordable financial product that might be a savings account, that might be a checking account. Uh, we've done work with organizations that have connected their um, uh, program participants to credit building loans or secured credit cards. 
Uh, many of you, many community action agencies I know run volunteer income tax assistance sites or VITA programs to make sure that uh, lower income and low wealth folks are getting access to free tax preparation and getting um, screened for tax credits for which they will be, might be eligible. Uh, we've seen folks provide IBAs or individual um, development accounts, which are a form of match savings account. Um, and then we've also seen groups offer different asset ownership programs. So this might be some form of small business development support or support with uh, going back to school for post-secondary education or some type of down payment assistance or housing counseling. And ultimately, which services organizations provide really should depend on the financial goals, needs, and interests um, of the program participants. And that'll be a theme when we talk about human-centered design. So we want to hear from you. Um, we invite you to submit in the chat box uh, some examples of how your organization supports families with building financial capability. I'm going to continue to present a few slides focused on why financial capability matters. Um, but we'll return to this question. So as you think of how your organization is supporting either building the knowledge, skills, or access to financial resources, we'd love you to share that in the chat box. So as many of us either have experienced personally or know through working with program participants, unstable balance sheets affect a multitude of different economic outcomes. So for example, Low savings can increase the cost of alternative financial services that can put families in that cycle of debt. Um, high debt can delay asset building. So if you're still paying off student loans, it may be challenging to uh, buy a home, put a down payment on a home. And then low credit can potentially lead to a loss of employment as employers are increasingly checking credit scores as part of the hiring process and certainly um, can be a barrier to obtaining stable housing. Additionally, being financially insecure leads people to operate with what we think of as a scarcity mindset. And so there was research um, documented in an amazing book called Scarcity. Uh, it was by Eldar Shafir, and I'm, I apologize, it's getting the, the name of the other pardon me, author. Um, but basically, they demonstrated how Scarcity of any resource, whether that's time or finances, can really impact our mental capacity. So for example, low income or low wealth individuals must constantly be calculating how to maximize the scarce resources they have. And these constant mental calculations, thinking about every penny that will be spent, leads to having less mental bandwidth or less space to think about the future or think about other important things in our lives. And this often leads to what they call in the book tunnel vision. And we've all likely experienced this at some point when we're either so busy in terms of time or so financially strapped that we can't think about anything beyond the here and now. And this reduced mental bandwidth is not only, um, uh, it not only negatively impacts our ability to plan for the future, it can also lead to serious mental, emotional, and physical health impacts. So what can we do? So a few years ago, or many years ago now, um, Prosperity Now, then CFED, developed the Household Financial Security Framework to illustrate from a household's perspective what it takes to build financial security over time. And so it starts with making sure we can all navigate the financial systems in which we live to be able to gather information and analyze choices to make the best financial decisions for ourselves. We need to be able to learn not only the basic skills related to finances, but also specific job skills that help us access quality, well-paying jobs. We need to earn sufficient income so that we have um, enough to cover expenses, but also have some left over to save. And we need to have that savings to be able to pay down debt or to have available for emergencies or future goals. Um, households need to be able to own, so a, um, to invest in some type of asset, whether that's a home, a business, or other type of investments. And throughout all this, households need protections. And those can either come in the form of insurance products that protect the income and um, savings of households, or in the form of consumer protections, so policies and practices that it makes it harder for um, 
uh, for alternative financial products and other stakeholders to take advantage of uh, people and their finances. So I alluded to earlier that financial stress affects many aspects of our lives. So it can affect both our mental, physical, and emotional health, and it affects our um, access to education, economic de development, as well as the jobs we have. So every social service provider is affected in some way by the financial health and wealth of their clients. So um, many of you mentioned that you uh, um, administer or run housing programs, and I'm sure you've seen that uh, housing programs struggle to keep clients in their homes when they don't have sufficient income or emergency savings. Uh, we work with a lot of workforce programs, and they are seeing their clients um, struggle to find jobs if they have low credit scores. And without tuition assistance that maybe a match savings account can help support, it's really hard to get training for a better job. So I asked earlier, how does your organization support families with building financial capability? So we want to pause here, and um, I wanted to see how often if, if folks have written anything in, and if we can get a sense of what are some of the products, services, or programs that our community action agencies on the phone are doing to support families. Sure. So thank you to everyone that's been submitting your responses. They're still coming in, um, but it's cool to see a lot of the things that you guys are doing. So it looks like a lot of our agencies on the phone today are doing financial counseling, credit repair coaching, um, home buyer education, seeing some savings match programs to help people start uh, with their first savings account. A lot of people are doing VITA as well, connecting folks to EITC and other tax-related benefits, debt repair, financial education, financial co coaching. It kind of runs the gamut, but folks are doing a lot of cool stuff. They're using um, your money, your goals, um, right. a lot of different other curriculums. So folks are doing the work. Great. Thank you for sharing that, Hyacinth, and thank you all for contributing those um, uh, those responses. So for those of you not familiar with Your Money, Your Goals, that is a, a toolkit that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau put out for frontline staff that is meant to be used in partnership with program participants to walk through a number of different financial topics. Um, it includes a self-assessment, it includes a, um, a, a cash flow budgeting tool, it includes different tips for increasing income, reducing expenses. Um, I have found it extremely uh, helpful as organizations think about embarking on this work. But I think some of the things that you, all, all the different services you mentioned in some way are trying to support our program participants with building the skills, the knowledge, or access to those products and services. So thank you so much for sharing. I'm also wondering, Hyacinth, if we've received any questions, because um, I'm happy to pause here and see if we've no. No questions just yet. Okay, great. So yeah, feel free to submit. We do have time at the very end for questions and answers, but feel free to submit your questions via the chat box at any point, and we'll be pausing throughout to, to see if as they come in. Great, so a human-centered design. Um, so human-centered design is an approach to um, designing and developing services that better meet program participant needs, and it's really based on using research methods to gather and evaluate stakeholder input, with clients being one of those stakeholders, to be able to design programs that really uh, achieve the intended outcome. So this, before I jump into some of the content, um, the spirit of human-centered design really is, as that name uh, alludes to is sort of centering clients and their needs in the programs and the services we design. So I want to hear from all of you about some characteristics of your clients. So I'm going to ask Hyacinth to launch this poll. And curious, feel free to select all that apply, but this is a list of uh, characteristics to describe your clients, maybe low income, low wealth, predominantly white, predominantly people of color, parents, immigrants, returning citizens. So it looks like folks are in, in those responses. Um, so you have about 30 more seconds to get your answers in, and then we will display them.
All right, so we're going to go ahead and close the poll. Thank you uh, to those of you that did respond. We'll see the responses here in just a second. Okay, great. So about half of you are serving low-income folks. Um, many parents are amongst your clients. Uh, also see um, about 19 predominantly white and 19 folks responded predominantly people of color. Uh, so I think that the highest uh, numbers here are low-income, low-wealth, and parents. So thank you for responding to that. Um, also wanted to get a sense from all of you, if you were to design a new program, what would be the first step you would take? So would you identify funding for the program? Would you talk with clients about their interests and goals? Would you talk to direct service staff, talk with community stakeholders? How would you approach this? The responses are still coming in. Um, we'll give folks maybe about 15 more seconds uh, to get in your answers. Please respond. Um, and then we'll post them on the screen. All right. Thanks to those of you that did respond. We're going to go ahead and close the poll, and I'm going to display the results here for us. So it looks like um, the highest percentage is talk to clients about their interests and goals, which is great to see. Um, and then uh, a few responses for identifying funding for the program, which is very real, and uh, talking with community stakeholders. But certainly the um, majority or the dominant answer was talk with clients about their interests and goals, which is wonderful to hear. Okay, so moving into the content of Human Centered Design, uh, this is a quote from a publication called Equity Centered Community Design Field Guide. And I think it speaks really well to this concept that we are all designers, no matter our field or our position. So the quote reads, as a teacher, nurse, politician, etc., your designs, also known as plans or decisions, impact others. How might we make sure that you're designing inclusive and equitable outcomes for all, no matter how big or small the decision? And that's really at the heart of human-centered design. It's about designing inclusive and equitable outcomes, regardless of the size of that decision, and really being intentional about the services and the products that you're offering. So I always get a bit of a chuckle out of this image, though I think it also, um, has a pretty poignant message. So this image highlights many different factors that play into how our programs are designed and how those factors often conflict with one another. So in this example, the intended outcome is in the bottom right corner. So what the client really needed from this program was a tire swing. However, as we progress from the top left um, to right of that top row, we see images of how the client explained his or her need, how the project manager understood it, how the proposal was written, how it was funded, how the executive director described it. Of course, that's the cushy chair. Um, and then on the bottom row, continuing how the program was implemented, how the client experienced it, how it was documented, and how it was supported after the first grant. And the point of these images is that there are many different factors that influence how a program is designed and implemented. And too often, the final result is not what the client really needed. So human-centered design is really asking this question about how can we better design programs that meet what the client really needs. The human-centered design process, it has three parts. So it's uh, an iterative process, starting with discover, design, and then test. So in the discover phase, we identify real addressable challenges from the client's perspective. 
In the design phase, we generate solutions with the voice of clients and other stakeholders. And then in the test phase, we address, or pardon me, we assess if solutions are on track to effectively address the challenge as intended. And so I wanted to share some examples of organizations that we've worked with at Prosperity Now and how they have used this approach. So last year, we worked with the state TANF program and they, um, we supported them in conducting different interviews and focus groups with their TANF clients. And the question that they were really trying to answer was, how might we help clients to develop and sustain a realistic budget? And one of the things that came out in the focus groups was that the clients were interested in getting support uh, with their budgeting. But anytime they mentioned that to case managers, they would be sent to sort of a generic uh, budgeting class that they didn't feel like um, really addressed some of the challenges they were facing. And so the TANF program decided to develop a partnership with a Catholic Charities in their state to provide budgeting workshops, but they were customized for very low income clients. And they also um, added a component of one-on-one -on -one coaching to support the clients who wanted additional budgeting support. So that's one example of how the, this program used kind of the client voice, the interviews, and the focus groups to help develop and design a new program. Another example is some work we did with the Foundation in Nebraska. They were serving youth in foster care, and they were particularly interested in how maybe support youth transitioning from foster care to build credit. And we created, and we worked with them to create what's called a concept board. It was basically a one-page flyer described this concept they had about providing a credit building loan to the young people. And we presented this one page, which is on the slide, and in the focus group asked young people, you know, what do you like about this product? What do you not like? Would you participate? How would, would you recommend it to friends? What, what concerns you? Um, and one of the key takeaways was that the young people were interested in the program has a complimentary one kind of potential counselor along with it. So the feedback that they provided was that they wanted to have type of additional support, uh, which is really helpful for me to hear um, any additional. And Jennifer, just as you are continuing, we're getting a little bit of like feedback. Your your kind of audio is going in and out just a little bit there. This so I'm going to continue and share some resources that Barron has around the Human Center Design for us. As you please submit your answers via the chat box, the ways that you're already going to focus, or ways that you um, you approach. So on our website, you can find uh, a toolkit, a Human Insights tool. So human insights is another way to talk about human-centered design. Um, and it's a set of tools and activities that can guide you through a human design process. So this slide shows um, some of the tools and activities in the discover design and test phase. So the discover phase includes activities that are really meant to shift the perspective from that of provider to that of the client. So this includes Sort of framing the challenge in the from the perspective of the client. Uh, this might include diagnosing uh, barriers through a client journey map. So this is where you think about the client from the time they um, learn about your program to the time they exit. What are their what is their experience through that journey? Um, this includes you know I gave those examples about inter individual interviews or focus groups, and then deciding on next steps. In the design phase, this is really where project team members have an opportunity to generate solutions that they think may help address the challenge. So this includes brainstorming those solutions, creating the concept boards that I talked about um, in the example of the credit building loan, drafting different prototypes and getting feedback from clients, and then ultimately checking and fi finalizing those design materials. And in the test phase, this is really an opportunity for you to gauge if the solutions that you've drafted are on track to effectively meet the intended outcome or the, the original need. And so this includes activities like 
surveying for concept appeal or conducting user tests or deciding on next steps. So again, all these, um, a full human insights toolkit is available on Prosperity Now's website. This was developed by our applied research team. Um, so I encourage you to take a look and feel free to reach out if you have, have questions as you use it. So how is the human centered design approach similar or different to how you have approached program design in the past? Hyacinth, can you tell us what we've heard from folks? So it looks like we, um, we've uh, gotten one response in, so maybe if folks are still typing it out, hopefully uh, send in your responses to this question here in the chat. Um, but let's see, one approach that we've gotten in the chat so far is the adult needs and strengths assessment um, has been used as a discovery model to learn about client strengths and needs. Um, but hopefully yes. we'll get some more responses from folks. Oh, I'm sorry, Jennifer. Go ahead. No, no, I think that's a great example. So, yeah, we've seen, we talked about the interviews and focus groups, but certainly surveys. We've seen folks use, um, so the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, part of the Your Money, Your Goals toolkit we talked about, has a um, self-assessment on financial well-being. There's the financial well-being scale, which is a survey that um, I've seen other organizations use. The Center for Financial Security has put out a financial capability survey. And then I've seen groups organ um, develop their own surveys just by kind of picking questions from, um, from, a, from a multitude of different surveys. Uh, so I think it's often good to start with, you know, what are, what are you already collecting about your clients? What do you already know about your program participants? And where might you want to fill in those gaps? So that's a great example of for the discover phase. Um, kind of testing your assumptions about the needs of clients through some of these surveys. And then a couple others that have come in as well is some of the client input that people actually do doing their community needs assessment, which is something that uh, community action agencies are required to do, you know, as a part of, um, you know, their internal regulations and things like that. So they're saying that actually involves a lot of that um, process with making sure that you include input getting some folks talking about um, a program called Getting Ahead. Um, some other folks are mentioning the adult needs and strengths assessment. Um, some people are saying that they actually have a participant advisory council. I love um, that. Yeah, so those are some of the responses we've gotten in so far. Great, thank you. So we recently did some work with youth workforce programs and many of those have youth advisory councils and we thought that was a great way to engage the, the program participants um, in thinking through changes in service delivery as well as new products and services, but also to get feedback as those services were rolled out to figure out what's going well, what's not going well. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll just say in closing, the real spirit or goal behind human-centered design is really making sure, as we said in the beginning, that we are uh, providing solutions and programs that are actually meeting the need of the client. So, you know, oftentimes we may, um, you know, have come up with a great idea or innovative idea and we think it's what the client needs, but without talking to multiple stakeholders, the client certainly, but also community members, staff, leadership, um, and others, it's difficult to design a program that will meet that need. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Chanel, and we're going to move into racial economic inequality. Actually, let me pause. I apologize, Chanel. Um, let me go back and see, Hyacinth, I didn't ask if there's any questions so far, either on the financial capability um, overview or human centered design. So we did get one question, actually, that came from your overview section in the beginning. Um, one of our folks would like to know, from your experience on your work um, with, you know, organizations, uh, what we're seeing in our community is that families who are at or below 175% of poverty oftentimes do not have enough funds to manage, um, and in fact, um, often cannot reliably meet their basic needs. Um, through your work, have you found a sweet spot income-wise for families to be able to make the best use of these types of uh, financial capability programs that you mentioned? Yeah, that's a great question. I appreciate that. And I do think, um, no, I know, I don't think we have found that exact 
200% or 250% of the poverty line. I know the Assets for Independence program, which was a match, federal match savings program, used to set eligibility at up to 200%, acknowledging that, you know, if you're really just trying to uh, get by and um, meet basic needs, it's hard to think about savings. So we have not, um, at Prosperity Now, defined a uh, specific uh, income level that we think uh, is best suited for some of these financial capability services. I think we have had a lot of discussions about the need for income, some type of income, um, to be able to pursue certain services. So, for example, we really like working, um, we found it beneficial working with youth workforce programs or workforce programs in general for adults as well, and to engage program participants in uh, setting up direct deposit or setting up savings accounts when they actually have some type of income, because it is very hard to apply lessons you're learning through a financial education class if you simply don't have that income. That said, I will say, I, I um, one thing I like about Your Money, Your Goals is it does start with resources like strategies to increase income, strategies to reduce debt, uh, pardon me, reduce expenses, and really starting at that very basic level. Um, and I do think that financial coaching, financial counseling, um, even uh, you know, financial education can be beneficial services to support people that are really just trying to get by. But certainly as you get into some of those other financial capability services like savings or asset ownership, um, that's where it is often helpful to have some income to be able to use. Chanel, I welcome, I like, don't want to put you on the spot, but I also welcome your input here as a former practitioner. Um, well, I saw another question came in that I was going to respond to that says, um, how do you advise low-income customers about saving when their asset tests uh, might disqualify them from the valuable benefits? And I think one thing that we um, really tried to encourage our participants to do was just to get into the habit of saving. Many of them, it was going to take them a significant amount of time to get to a place where they would um, save more than uh, what would allow them to be disqualified, but to get into the habit of trying to set aside um, something. And what we found more often for our lower income families was that their emergencies were going to be in the range of $300 to $400. And oftentimes that could be something like needing to repair cars, getting a car battery, um, or even, you know, making sure their children had the uniforms that they needed for school when school started. So we didn't necessarily run into issues with families needing to save thousands of dollars, but oftentimes it was going to be something that was more in that 300 to $400, um, you know, range that was going to be what could create some type of financial snowball eclipse for them. Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, have we seen any other questions coming in, Hyacinth? Um, No questions. Thank you for now, uh, Chanel, for raising it. I was getting ready to try to jump in there. Um, no, we just got another co-sign, actually, just for your money, your goals, and both of the relating to both of the questions that we got in about how um, a couple of folks have been able to use that to at least prepare folks and start to build some of those skills, even if they might not have, you know, they might have some of those issues around income. Um, and starting to figure that out. So just a couple of folks have been able to use that curriculum to help engage folks and still work with them as they need to kind of get up to speed in some of those other areas. So other than that, no other questions, so. Great, thank you. And I will say that, um, you know, perhaps th this particular webinar, we're focused a lot on um, kind of different products and services and how to design programs to better meet um, program participants' needs and goals and interests. And I, I do also want to acknowledge that, you know, at Prosperity Now, we do a lot related to um, advocacy at federal, local, and state level, equipping local and state advocates with the resources to push for policies and practices to address some of the, the issues folks are raising around, you know, just not having enough income and what are some of the uh, uh, workforce policies and practices that we can implement to improve that, or on the asset limits uh, question, uh, equipping advocates at the state level to be able to advocate to eliminate, ideally eliminate or um, raise the asset test so high that it, it really is ineffective and in, um, negatively impacting lower income folks. So I, I, 
yeah, I don't want to paint <laughs> the picture, the naive, naive picture that, you know, when people are really struggling to get by, that just a financial education class or just, um, you know, a couple sessions with a coach are going to uh, fix that those larger systemic issues. And I think this segues nicely into conversation about racial economic inequality and some of the barriers that we're facing being uh, much greater than sort of providing services to get ourselves out of these challenges. Uh, that said, I think it can be really beneficial to folks that are struggling to know what resources are available to them um, and to leverage some of the, 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 the toolkits that um, the participants are mentioning, like your money, your goals. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Chanel. And again, keep your questions coming. Um, we will have time at the very end to answer them. All right, thank you, and great job, Jennifer. So for the rest of the conversation, we are going to move into discussing racial economic inequality. Um, and I want to encourage you all to kind of be prepared to lean in. We're going to go through um, a lot of information today that's going to provide some type of historical context. And then when we get back on the call in November, we'll go um, a little bit deeper in. So it may feel a little bit overwhelming, but just want to encourage you to stick with us over the next little while, post questions, um, and we're ready to move on. So Jennifer, if you'll go ahead and advance the slide. So we want to start this part of the conversation with a poll. Um, does your organization consider racial inequality as you design your program? Um, and that poll is up. If you'll go ahead and answer that, or it should be coming up, sorry. I'm not seeing the poll on my side. I'm not sure. Hi, Cynthia, is that um, coming up? No, I'm not either. Hi, Cynthia. Sorry okay. about that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> my computer okay. was Sorry. really was thinking computer. about it. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Thank you. So the question is I'm not sure. I imagine she's trying to figure that out. But why don't we continue and we can revisit the poll? Oh, to pop up? No. Um, let's move forward and then we can revisit it if this can get it working. Well, it looks like the poll okay. is up. Okay. It's up on our side. Okay. Yeah, it's up on our side. Jennifer, I think we may be getting a little bit of a delay. Um, your picture's going in and out, so it might be a little slow on your end, but it's up. So, hi, Smith, have we had, had the people had opportunity to answer this question? Um, well, maybe we'll give folks about 10 more seconds. So, guys, if you haven't, okay. please be sure to submit your responses so we can get, you know, an accurate picture of what folks are doing, because I think this is an important question. All right, got about five more seconds, and then I will close the poll. All right, I'm going to close it here for us, and the results should pop up shortly. Are you able to All see right. those? So like I am. So it looks like maybe not quite 30% are taking that into consideration, and then we have about 21% that are not sure. So we'll talk about that, and as we talk about program design and human-centered design, those things will come up as well. So let's delve, um, delve into the conversation. So as we explore the topic of racial inequality today, I would like for um, some of you who may have already seen this or to introduce to others a very detailed infographic, and it's called Government Boost and Blocks to Build Wealth, which was created by the United for a Fair Economy. One of the things that I think is important is that it would definitely be a misstep for us to move through conversations about financial abilities and fail to acknowledge that the historical context of our government's intentions to create wealth or a concept of wealth for white people while systemically creating policies to block wealth for people of color. There are a couple things that I think are really important for us to look at. One is that our country was created, created rules to ensure a wealth divide. For example, rules determine who could own land, who could vote, and who could be kept as slaves or indentured servants. Even in the 20th century, governmental programs continued to create unfair, unethical, but legal practices to boost the wealth of whites while blocking opportunities for blacks. Some of those things you'll see, and if you look at the um, infographs, the um, items that are listed below in perhaps the um, reds, browns, and yellows show what some of those um, blocks are. But one is the Federal Housing Administration adopted practices of redlining or discriminatory discriminatory rating system that was used to evaluate the risks associated with mortgage loan products in specific urban neighborhoods. 
This resulted in lower tax values and essentially reduced the equity families of colors could obtain from home ownership. The initial Social Security Act excluded agricultural workers, bellhops, or motorcade workers and domestics who were often black and brown from being able to obtain years worth of um, financial credit. Um, and these laws were not amended until the 1950s and many of our black ancestors were denied years of work credit into the social security system. And to bring that into present day, I like to share with people that my grandmother is 101 years old. She'll be 102 next month. And many years she worked as a domesticated worker and did not get any work credit for that. And so for years her work was not only was she paid lower wages, but also didn't receive the credit that she should have. And so now they impact even the amount of money that she's um, receiving from Social Security. Other government policies that helped white people gain wealth and excluded others included the Homestead Act of 1862. And then we look at things like the GI Bill, among other policies that were created, where we had people of color that went off to fight um, in a war, came home and should have received benefits to help them, but were not allowed to even participate in higher education and those types of things. Uh, and then when we review the data and the history of this country, three things are evident while hard to digest. The first being that all white people, no matter when they came to the United States have benefited from white supremacist policies that created unfair advantages of whites over all other groups of people. From the Naturalization Act of 1795 that specified that citizenship was reserved only for free white people, to even some of the modern day laws, such as the one in Arizona that was passed in 2010, that gave police the right to stop anyone who they deemed didn't look like they were in this country legally. And this law wasn't vacated until 2016. Most people with great wealth inherited most of it. And inherited wealth is not wealth people earn by their own hard work. It is unearned wealth. Much of this unearned wealth was the product of white supremacist policies. Therefore, the wealth advantages that many white people have received today are based on past exploitation. The institutions of slavery, which lasted for 300 years in the United States, is a really good example of past exploitation and the continuing legacy. So what we recognize is that wealth opportunities and obstacles continue to impact the present because wealth is generated, I'm sorry, wealth is transferred from one generation to another. And so while this image is hard to, um, for some of you to view, we've included that link in our um, notes for you to be able to download and continue to look at that and take it a little bit further. So if we move to the next slide, then I'd like to ask you, um, as we move forward, what about the history surprises you or affirms what you already knew? Um, I think sometimes we take for um, granted that this is something that surprises some people that they have not been aware of, it, but there are many people who have spent some time understanding and recognizing some of those, and we just want to get some feedback. So if you'll share those in the chat box, we will come back to those in just a few minutes. But share your thoughts about what we just discussed in the government boost and block. And we'll go ahead and move to the next slide. And so I want to encourage us to take a look at the narratives that were used um, when we discussed the racial wealth gap um, as opposed to the true racial wealth inequality. As we cover the next four slides, one of the things that I want to be transparent about is that this information and this work is not something that I own. It is information that I've been able to pull from the work of many of my colleagues over the last few years um, and just want to, you know, be transparent and saying that these are not my original thoughts. But we must challenge the false narrative that suggests that people of color lack wealth because the system is set up on a level playing field. We must challenge this narrative that um, people of color fail to manage their finances so we continue to throw money at financial capability programs and training. We need to challenge the narrative that says if they save more money, they would be in better positions. And also, if they took classes in behavior economics, if they understood more about their money habitudes or money personality, that they would make better personal decisions. The real and true conversations we need to lift and continue to lean into is that this country was designed to reward the wealthy while leaving everyone else behind. And so we must challenge and dismantle a system that supports, one, an upside-down tax system, which, is provided to provide, which was created to provide substantial breaks to the top 1%, and calls everyone in the lower income brackets to carry the cost and the burden. We must also be willing to take a look at residential economic segregation, which creates um, concentrated pockets of poverty. It excludes opportunities for individuals, for um, individual property value and acceleration. 
And finally, also looking at the lack of investments in disenfranchised communities, where no resources are being poured into communities, which result often in decreasing jobs, lack of access to fresh food sources. We have um, many food deficits. Communities that are being filled with dollar trees and dollar generals that negatively impact the tax values of homeowners. Lower resources are often poured into our schools, which create higher educational disparities. And then there's also a higher level of policing, which results in higher arrests and a disproportionate number of fees and fines that impact people's financial well-being. And finally, when we take a look at just the emotional stress of poverty, which results in higher rates of health disparities. So I challenge that we must be willing to tell true stories about where we are with this racial wealth inequality. Jennifer, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. So what we want to look at is um, there are four levels of racism, and often when we talk about racism, the challenge is most people will stop and only focus on internalized racism. But today we want to quickly walk through um, all four levels of this. So the first is internalized racism. With internalized racism, there is a standard for what is appropriate or normal that people of color accept are white people's or Eurocentric standards. There's also a system in place that misnames the problems of racism as a problem of or caused by people of color and blame the disease, emotional, economic, or political issues on people of color. An example of that may be that during slavery, slave owners argued that black people needed to be whipped and chained in order to work, that they were lazy and unable to care for themselves, that we shouldn't be left to our own devices, but we needed structure and systems enforced by white people. Today we may see things like in our current political climate, blaming immigrants and refugees for being undocumented and stealing jobs. As we start to look at the interpersonal levels of racism, um, those are more focused on, um, you know, public expressions of racial prejudice, hate, bias, bigotry, um, or things that are going on between individuals, telling racist jokes, using racial epithets, or believing inherently that the superiority of white over all other people. And when we look at that, that may be things as avoiding people of color who you don't know personally, but not avoiding whites who you don't know. That can mean something like white people crossing the street when they come into contact with people of color, um, you know, young Latinos, um, young um, students of color, people locking their doors when they see African-American families sitting out on the doorstep or just taking a walk, um, and then accepting things as they are. Those are all kind of listed as um, forms of collusion. But then when we really get into the heart of the matter and the things that we really have to start challenging is institutional racism, government policies that explicitly restrict the ability of people to be able to get loans, to buy, improve their neighborhoods, um, looking at things like high concentrations of African Americans in specific places, and even challenging um, city sanitation departments where they um, are going to have trash transfer stations, um, other environmental hazards, and where they're located in our community, and how they impact um, communities of color. And finally, when we look at structural racism, uh, for example, we can see structural um, racism in many forms, institutional, cultural, and structural factors that contribute to the lower life expectancy of African American um, and Native American men compared to white men. These include um, things because they've had higher and longer exposures to environmental toxins, the dangerous jobs, unhealthy housing stocks, even higher exposures to more lethal consequences for reacting to violence, stress, and racism. And finally, when we look at racial equity, one of the things that we have to remember is the situation where one cannot predict an individual or group's access to resources or likelihood of well-being and social status simply because it's based on an individual's race. All right, let's go to the next slide. So the next few slides, we're going to be sharing some um, data with you. This particular slide talks about the racial wealth divide from 1983 to 2016. Now, since 2014, the Assets and Opportunity Profile um, releases data every, few year, every year. And this data shows that two out of three, or 61% of households of color, are liquid asset poor, which means that they have less than three months' worth of savings, um, which conservatively is going to be a little under $6,000 for a family of four. This lack of savings corresponds with the overall lower wealth and assets. Additionally, Prosperity Now found that households of color have approximately one-tenth of the median net worth, or that's the assets minus debt, of white households. So that's the difference between $12,377 and $110,637. 
The Prosperity Now Government Affairs team released a study um, called The Racial Wealth Gap is Growing, and it shed some very startling statistics for us. One is that the racial wealth gap far exceeds the racial income gap. And typically when we talk about gaps, individuals get stuck on um, there is not a gap in income. But in, until we are able to close the wealth gap, which means it's going to be a perpetual transitional and um, legacy transfer of wealth that this gap continues to grow. When we look at this growing gap, we see that it has doubled in the past three decades. In 1983, the average wealth of white families was 200, 200, I'm sorry, $230,000 higher than the average wealth of African American um, and Hispanic families. In 2010, we saw that that number increased to more than 500000 we also see that the home ownership rates for people of color or households of color is 26 percentage points below the rate of um, white households. And so the research shows that um, home ownership gaps continue to get larger, and home ownership happens to be the largest way that families are able to transfer wealth. Go ahead and transition. All right, we'll go to the next slide. And so when we look at the fact that wealth isn't being distributed um, equally, when we look at this median net worth, we see the differences between, um, that I highlighted in the um, previous slide, the difference between white um, households of color being black families and Latino families, that the median household um, is more than 16 times the wealth of median black families and eight times the wealth of median or Latino households. All right, Jennifer, we'll go ahead. And then when we look at the disconnection between um, education and wealth, one of the things that we see is education has always been the factor that African-American families have said would be the bargaining or the closing of the wealth gap. But what we see here is that um, there's a phenomenon that is showing that while we have individuals who are increasing their ability to get education, that the natural results of public policies throughout our history have been set up so that this still is not enough to close out that wealth gap. Jennifer, we'll go into the next slide. And then when we take a look at the liquid asset um, rate, this, is, this rate only speaks to the amount of money that a family needs to be able to sustain themselves at a poverty level. We still see the 62.7% of black households and 62.5% of Latino households are still experiencing um, liquid asset poverty. And remember when we talked about asset poverty, that's the amount of money to be able to manage your personal experiences. But even when we talk about being able to maintain at a um, poverty level, that we still see that these households of color are struggling with that. Jennifer, we can go on to the next slide. And then when we take a look at uh, what we see and how wealth and disparities impact households, I'm sorry, health outcomes by race and ethnicity we see that uh, families of color are going to be the highest rate of the uninsured, and we're also looking at the gap between the number of people who are having to forego doctor's visits, and those numbers are increasing on a yearly basis, um, and all of that does impact the health. So we'll go on to the next slide. So we asked the question um, in the beginning as we started this, what about this history surprises for firms what you already knew? So hi, since we're going to I'm going over to you to share some of the thoughts. I see a lot of things are coming into the comments. Sure. Yeah, and thank you to everyone um, for some of your thoughtful responses, um, which we'll share now. Um, but someone really appreciated you sharing the specific example coming from your family and talking about your grandmother and how, you know, a lot of the policies that were in place actually continue to impact her through, you know, what she's able to claim through uh, her Social Security, just looking at like the extent of the history, how long these kinds of things went on. We actually had a question. Um, someone wanted to know um, if you could go back and repeat the information on that law that you passed, I think it, that you mentioned was repealed in 2016, I think in Arizona that had to do with one of the policies that's on the infographic? Yes, I believe, okay, yes, I believe, wait, let me get my notes. I believe it's the bill 170, it was called, let's see. In 2010, SB, uh, so Bill 1070, and in that bill, what it did was it gave the police the right to be able to stop anyone that they deemed who did not look like they were in this country legally. 
So when we talk about, you know, in D.C. we had to stop and frisk. So basically without any reason other than how a person looks, individuals were being able to be stopped, asked for their identification. They had to prove that they had citizenship. And often when we see these types of things with heavy police presence, often means the individuals who may have, um, let's say, you know, maybe you're driving and you don't have the correct insurance, but you're being stopped because police are often in your communities more frequently. We're creating an excess, um, a number of fees and fines which impact people's ability to be able to go back and forth to work because now they're caught up in um, a legal system for no other reason than someone assumed that there was something guilty about them. Right. You know, Thank and those you. types of things happen frequently, um, but that, that was redacted in 2016. Um, but I like to share with people, you know, my son, he's 25 now, lives in Tulsa, Oklahoma, but we live in the suburbs. And when he first started driving, he was stopped, I believe, nine times from the time he came off the main highway until he got to our home for the entire time he drove for the next two years just because people wanted to know, where are you going? He wasn't speeding, never was breaking the law, never received a ticket. But, um, you know, just that constant threat of always being um in the police presence and having a, you know, a very heavy presence. And we live in a community that's probably about 80% white. And so he, we felt like he was constantly being targeted by our local police department and sheriff department only because he was a black male driving at night in the suburbs. Right. Thank you for that. Um, uh, just yes. to share a couple of other responses um, that have come in as well. People really appreciated you kind of zeroing in on the multi-generational impact of a lot of these things and how just because some of these things might not be going on now, we still, you know, haven't necessarily done the work to deal with what happened in the past and those things kind of build exponentially over time. Um, we had um, some folks talking about um, their own experiences with dealing with this work as they've gotten more into, you know, just reading about it and learning more about it as it's come into the, you know, public discussion over the last couple of years. Um, someone shared that, you know, at first I was slow coming to the realization of actually just how much the government uh, played a role in a lot of the systemic racism that we're seeing. Um, they talked about housing segregation in particular, um, and that just caused them to reflect on maybe their own education in another government system, kind of bringing in some of those perspectives. Um, so, yeah, I appreciate everyone's responses, but people seem to be really, you know, just impacted, I think, just by the enormity of this concept and that, you know, we still have to deal with things that happened 300 years ago. Right. And as we prepare for November, I would um, encourage you all, if you want to drop questions or um, some things you'd like to delve deeper into, share those with us or send them to Hyacinth so we can make sure that when we get into this conversation deeper, that we make sure that we're answering the questions, concerns, um, you know, that you may have as we talk more about, um, you know, how systems and policies really do impact wealth. Mm -hmm. And I'll just say, this is Jen, that kind of bringing this all together, we talked about financial capability, we talked about human-centered design, we talked about racial wealth and equality, and I think one of the messages that we um, want to leave you with is that, unfortunately, one of the, if not the most um, influential determinant of a person's financial well-being often is their race because of um, systemic uh, discrimination and policy, current and historical policies and practices. And so when we think about designing and delivering programs and services to, we need to think beyond just sort of it's business as usual. And I think one of the things that I have really learned through this journey is recognizing that if we want equitable outcomes, that doesn't necessarily mean, in fact, it, it can't mean equal same services and programs um, for everyone. So part of the spirit of human-centered design and human insights is thinking about how do we tailor our programs, our services to the lived experiences, the goals, the needs, the interests of our program participants recognizing that there are these systems in place that are working against um, uh, economic advancement and opportunity. So 
in our final 15 minutes, uh, we welcome you to share any additional questions or comments you have. I am going to share a few resources, uh, just if any of these topics really interest you and you want to find out where you can learn more. Um, on Prosperity Now's website, there is a Human Insights uh, Toolkit and Tools and Resources page. We have um, a page that links to a number of different resources on financial capability. You can visit our Racial Wealth Equity page. Um, Prosperity Now has a Racial Wealth Divide Initiative team that posts a number of different uh, resources and blogs and briefs that may be of interest to you. And Chanel referenced uh, several different data points that came directly from Prosperity Now Scorecard. This is an annual resource that we put out that it looks at um, outcomes across five different uh, areas, uh, financial assets and income, business and jobs, education, housing, and uh, health. And these are outcomes um, that are, many of them are broken down by race. Um, they are also broken down by state. And so you can look and see how residents in your state fare in terms of key uh, economic outcomes. Um, and so I leave you with those uh, four resources. And I will now just open it up to see if there's any final questions or comments. So while folks are getting in their questions, maybe I'll help to get the creative juices flowing. Um, and I'll pose a question to both of you guys, um, Janelle, uh, Jennifer and Chanel, sorry. Um, but just based on kind of everything that we've talked about today, if folks had to kind of walk away with one or two high level points of this, because we see that people are doing a lot of this financial capability work already, what are one or two things that you really want to make sure that people walk away from our conversation today, taking into their work going forward? That's a great question. I think for me, um, I would say that as we are working with individuals creating programs, that we must ensure that we are not putting the onus back on the participants to correct what's broken and that, you know, we need to inform the people that we, we're working with that some of those things that they're facing are not, they have nothing to do with their own um, choices you know, that this is a system and that we're all working together to address these systems. And while we're doing it, you know, we're going to do what we can to support you. Yeah, I think that's spot on. And I would say um, another message is that maybe this has to be an iterative process, any sort of program design and delivery. We need to continually be, it's, you know, we present it as there's a discover, there's a design and a test phase. Um, but uh, rather than be just linear, it's actually more of an ongoing cycle of continually getting feedback, assessing data um, to really take a hard look at are, you, are we um, solving for the problem that's actually present and how do we get input from a wide range of stakeholders and center uh, client voices make sure that the actual needs are being served. Thank you both. Um, and, if, and if I can kind of maybe jump in on like my own question, um, but I know one of the things that we've seen through our work um, in, you know, facilitating some learning cohorts and conversations with other community action agencies across the country, but one of the biggest things that I think was definitely an undercurrent in both of your conversations and your responses, but it's just to make sure as much as you can, like, do not assume things about the, the clients that you're serving. Don't assume what you feel like they need, what you feel like their problems are, what you feel like maybe the systemic problems are that are impacting them. Make sure that you take and really capitalize on every opportunity to just ask them. We have seen so many times, um, you know, through community action agencies that really wanted to do like a more integrative, holistic approach, um, by taking that time to really just ask, you know, their customers and their community, what is it that you actually feel like are the problems relating to building financial capability? They were thinking they were gonna come in with just doing like a budgeting class, when people know how to budget, you know, when you're living paycheck to paycheck, that's something that you actually have to be pretty well versed in. But just having like those town hall conversations, they were able to really develop some robust 
and innovative uh, programs that not only better met their needs, but also thinking about that empowerment piece gave their clients an opportunity to feel engaged and welcomed as not just a recipient of services, but as an expert in this work because they know better than we can ever tell them what they need and what the problems are. So that's one thing I might add. Yes, yeah, definitely. Thank you for that, Hi, so I think that's a great, a great takeaway. Sure. And, and I would add so, that but what are the challenges, but also like what are like the, the strengths uh, that clients bring and um, how are they navigating and being resilient in the face of a system that's really not supporting them and getting ahead. So um, I know this is a big, a big part of Head Start programs, which many community action agencies run, is that strength-based approach. And I think that's something that um, we certainly support at Prosperity Now is thinking not just about um, uh, the needs and the challenges, but how are uh, program participants, um, you know, leveraging their strengths and being resilient in the face of these challenges. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so we did get a question in. So um, this participant talked about really enjoying um, the conversation on racial equity, and maybe if you had any specific advice or maybe resources on how to kind of start off in this conversation, given that it can kind of be uncomfortable to bring up if folks, you know, might not have the wealth of understanding as it relates to some of the history and policies around the racial wealth gap. Any suggestions on maybe where to start in that conversation? Um, one book I would recommend is Tom Shapiro's Toxic Inequality. Um, I can't remember the author of the other book. It's on my nightstand, but why are the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? Um, and hmm, let's see what else right. I guess those would be some of my top two, but I encourage people just to be prepared um, and become comfortable with having uncomfortable conversations. And it really starts as a um, conversation that has to be a shift in the culture of organizations, what they are willing to see, what they're willing to accept. And I think when you start with data and you lead that data into the conversations about what's happening in your life and what you're hearing from your clients, um, you slowly will see a shift in the climate. It's not going to be an overnight change. And typically it's not going to be something people are going to be jumping up and down um, you know, excited to hear because oftentimes when we look at our organizations, especially nonprofits, they tend to be um, led by white males who um, oftentimes are going to be, you know, resistant and having that conversation that speaks to the fact that they are the beneficiaries of a system that was set up to uplift specifically white males and, you know, white women had the opportunity just to follow suit by race. So mm -hmm. proceed cautiously and bravely. Yeah, I think that's, those are great suggestions, Chanel. And I would just add one thing that um, we've shifted doing in our technical assistance to organizations uh, around developing theories of change, which I think is, um, you know, often a strategy that community-based organizations do, um, is to not just describe the problem and how your organization is going to, the products, the services, the program is going to be used to solve that challenge, but to ask why that problem exists. So um, describing the challenges uh, from the data, but also questioning why are the, why do those disparities or why do those outcomes exist? Um, and, and, and putting that as part of your narrative and then turning around solutions for that. I think that can be really powerful to um, acknowledge and recognize some of these systemic barriers and not um, unintentionally, or maybe, yeah, I'll go with unintentionally, place blame on um, participants for the economic situations they're in. Thank you both. Um, and a great resource that we've used, I can even share in some of our internal conversations, um, is that scorecard. Um, you guys, especially over the last couple of years, really have gotten into the nuances of looking at those racial disparities and looking at a lot of those different indicators and outcomes that kind of lead to those things that let you just kind of have a more objective conversation that regardless of your political beliefs or feelings, we see that people of certain backgrounds are just simply not doing as well across the board. Why is that? And if in our work as human service providers, we want to make sure that people are doing well, like in community action, we want to make sure that we're fulfilling that promise and serving the entire community, 
what are things that we can strategize about doing, you know, to make sure that people are meeting these outcomes um, across the board. So that's a great tool um, that I would definitely recommend to folks. Um, so I'm not seeing any other questions in. Um, so maybe I'll tee it up to Jennifer and Chanel. Any kind of closing thoughts or remarks before we kind of wrap up here? I just oh, want to say thank you. Oh, go ahead, Chanel. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you all for joining in, and we are looking forward to continuing this conversation with you all over the next um, two months and look forward to delving in deeper. Yes, and ditto, just want to say thank you, everyone, for joining. And uh, please, yes, I think uh, I should probably start to share these slides, and you can connect with the, the resources that we posted on the last slide. But if you do have any um, follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we're happy to work with you. Awesome. Thank you both so much. Um, we really appreciate this thorough discussion. I know, like you said, Jennifer, we kind of had a lofty agenda, but I think we got through it, and I think we were able to have a really um, engaging discussion about it. Um, so thank you to our wonderful colleagues from Prosperity Now for jumping into this conversation with us, and we look forward to continuing it. Great. So yeah. we kind of did the comments and discussion, just a couple of quick things from the partnership just related to some other um, learning opportunities and engagements that we have. If you want to keep going forward in this conversation or learn about some of our other topic areas, um, a place where we were actually developing a lot of this content and sharing it out for folks um, free of charge is on our Community Action Academy site. There you can register, you can create your own account, and we actually have a number of different uh, completely free on-demand courses on various anti-poverty practices and topics that you guys can access, um, both on your computer but also through our new mobile app for Community Action Academy, so check that out when you can. Um, we're actually going to be having a specific course coming out soon over the next couple of months related to a lot of the content that we've talked about today, so you'll be able to share and take a lot of that learning with you and share it throughout uh, your organization as well. Here's the contact information for the internal LCRC team. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, ideas, um, please feel free to reach out to any of us. We're very happy to hear from you all. Um, to kind of finalize on the questions, um, again, a reminder, today's presentation will be sent out to everybody in addition to all of the resources that were shared and discussed today. I'll also make sure that I will include um, Jennifer and Chanel's contact information, if that's okay with you ladies. Um, in our follow-up email so folks can reach out with any questions. Um, if there are no other questions or comments, um, that is actually going to conclude our webinar today. Thank you all so much for joining us, being a part of this conversation with us. Again, want to give um, a big thank you to our wonderful colleagues, Prosperity Now, Jennifer and Chanel, uh, for walking us through this content. And we will see you all next time. Thanks so much, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.